Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. How are we okay on this slide here? Did you great. want to put the umbrella? Or how am I okay on lighting? Looks great. Okay. All right. Umbrella, but that's great. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Rabbi Vincent T. Adams, and I'm co-founder of Ed's High M Temple and Energy Center, along with my lovely wife, Navia Leslie Adams. Shabbat and we just want to welcome you and say Shabbat Shalom, Lunar Full Moon Shabbat Shalom. Moon. Okay? Full power, mm -hmm. full healing, full restoration, mm -hmm. full. 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 Okay? <laughs> All right. You know, today's Torah portion is called Chukat. Chukat. And it involves the story of the, the red heifer. And again, you know, if you've been tagging along with us for the past, goodness, uh, 39 weeks as of today, you know that we are exploring the meaning of the Torah portion, the, particularly the first or the second verse of the Torah portion as it pertains to healing and health you know it, we started 19 1 you know numbers 19 1 and go to numbers 22 1 uh this week for the torah portion and as we as always uh i like to read the torah portion to you in king james and also the new american standard and then read it from a messianic translation and end with a Kabbalistic or rabbinical translation. It's not always Kabbalistic. Sometimes it's just a rabbinical translation. And we're going to do that today. So I'm going to get right to it and begin reading today's Torah portion, Numbers 19.1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance. This is the ordinance of the law, which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. Okay, then in New American Standard, then the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the statue of the law, which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, that they bring you an unblemished red heifer, in which is no defect, and on which a yoke has never been placed. All right, now, Let's read it from a, a messianic translation. Okay. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, This is the statue of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect, in which there is no blemish, and on which a yoke has never come. Messianic. Now, let's read a rabbinical translation from the Kabbalistic Bible. Okay, take me a quick second to get there. Chukot means the, this is the ordinance, this is the statute. Okay, almost there. Okay, here we go. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, This is the statue of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer, faultless, with no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. So how was this 
correspond to instructions on healing and what part of the body is this talking about or what aspect of our lives or or circumstances does this heal and as usual I don't know if as usual but as many uh, times this has happened I, I look at it and I come up with a complete blank and I go uh oh is the you know if you've been following me I say is this the week where it ends you know every week I get revelation on what part of the body this is healing what sickness or disease this is eliminating what circumstance or condition of our lives is this affecting and I looked at it at first and then the answer quickly came in and it began to come in like a flood as it always is done you know for 40 weeks now today marked 40 weeks that this has happened and the, the, the Lord hasn't hasn't let me down. Is it day 40 weeks or is it 39 weeks? Let me let me take a look at this. No, this is the 39th week. For 39 straight weeks, this has been the case. And remember, we're looking at the first verse or the, the first two verses of the week's uh, Torah portion. And we have to crack the code. We have to figure out how to crack the code. And again, what did I tell you to do? You, you read it. Perhaps you think of it anthropomorphically, or sometimes uh, it's kind of plain and clear as to what is healing by what parts of the body it's referencing, or what parts of the body have to be used in order to carry this out. And so we. I did all of that. I also told you, look at the verse or two immediately preceding the, the Torah portion. Or, and also look at the verse immediately or two immediately following the Torah portion. And those two aspects will help you close in on the code. And again, that's true today. You know, by doing that, it zeroes in on the meaning or gives me the uh, the key to, to crack the code. And as always, it's very interesting, very revelatory, well, you know, when I do that. It's, oh, wow, let, you know, ain't God good. Let, you know, take a look at this again and so when I look at it of course we have uh, the first verse was said and the Lord spoke the only thing difference this time is that he spoke to it may not be a difference but we do know you know most of the time it said the Lord spoke to Moses and it says tell Aaron and the priest to do something or tell the sons of Israel to do something. This time, he speaks to both Moses and Aaron at the same time. Now, that could be a clue, okay? It's one that I did not uh, ponder in detail. Remember, I don't study this weeks and months and days in advance. I study this the very day that we're teaching on the Torah portion because I want to remain in that particular anointing for the revelation. So a lot of these um, codes have deeper and deeper meaning that we're not going into. You know, it's safe to say we're only scratching the surface, but that's with all scripture. Okay, this is the first cycle of study on the Torah portion utilizing um, these 
aspects of cracking the cold. So I'm sure as the years, as you keep doing this, you keep repeating the cycle. We're going to get more and more and more. I, I don't know. I was raised in church, and I've always heard preachers say that, you know, every time I teach on this particular scripture, I get something more, something deeper. And I've noticed that ever since I've been observing Shabbat, and observing the feast days and the cycles of that every year. I spiral in deeper and deeper and deeper each year. So there's definitely more to come with this. I mean, you think about it, if you grew up in church or went to church even sporadically, um, your understanding, say, of Easter increased. You know, at first it was you know, Easter eggs and the bunny rabbit and all, you know, that type of nonsense. And then you began to understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua and, and the different aspects of that uh, biblical story. You know, every year you gain um, information, you gain more insight into that whole story. Well, the same is true on these Torah courses for you. And like I said, this is the first go round. This is the first go round here. You know, treat yourself as well as me as you're a five or a six year old. And you have just learned about the Easter Bunny and Easter eggs. You're at that level, perhaps, maybe a little bit uh, deeper than that, but you understand my meaning with this. Well, we see that the Lord spake or spoke to Moses and Aaron. And we've gone over it almost every week now. I'm not I'm exaggerating. But for a number of weeks now, we've seen this type of format where the Lord is speaking to either Moses, and in this case, Moses and Aaron, and commands them to, in turn, speak to the Levites, and then to the general congregation. And we know what that is healing, you know, ears, which correspond to kidneys, tongue, which corresponds to heart, and even eyes, which corresponds to the liver, and how in oriental medicine, what that means, and what that is healing. And here we have that same format in verse 1. But then when we add verse 2 to it, now we get on to something new, something more dynamic than what is revealed in verse 1. But it also shows you how important it is to have good, strong kidneys. And the Lord needs to heal that, you know, on almost a weekly basis, as it, it would seem. So, but... Moving down to verse 2, it says, This is the ordinance, Shukah, of the law, which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. Now, the ch now that anointing that Moses and Aaron received is now going to be received by the general congregation. That they bring the, you, you know, they got to bring it legs and arms, a red heifer without spot or blemish. Now, the fact that God is instructing them to bring a cow for a sacrifice is nothing new. But the fact that it has to be red, that it has to be a red heifer, every sacrifice made to God had to be without blemish, without defect. You couldn't blame, you couldn't, excuse me, you couldn't bring a lame or a blind cow and sacrifice that to God. I don't care if it was the firstborn or not. It had to be completely healthy, completely whole. It couldn't be, you know, you see these cows now, um, they use them as 
mascots for various companies that are black and white. You know, they had this, you know, big black spot, then a white spot, then a black spot, you know. It couldn't be one of those. It had to be no blemish whatsoever. One color. One color. Couldn't be lame, couldn't be uh, blind, couldn't be deaf, or have any type of defect whatsoever. So that's nothing new. But the fact that it had to be red is striking. Why a red heifer? So let's look at that, you know, what could red possibly symbolize? And the first thing I said when I saw it, when the revelation began to come forth, red, the blood, the blood. The red heifer, remember, the old saying is that the old is in the new revealed and the new is in the old concealed. Here I would say, this is talking about the blood of Yeshua. You know, Yeshua was spotless, sinless, no sin whatsoever, you know, completely sinless, completely God and fully man at the same time, without spot or blemish or wrinkle. Amen? So this sacrifice of the red heifer is a forerunner to the sacrifice of Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach on the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a forerunner. It's a foretaste of the glory divine, which is, you know, which was still to come. And that they were commanded to bring uh, to Aaron and the priests in order to be sacrificed. And the verses after this talks about the manner in which the sacrifice had to occur. This sacrifice, I'll just tell you straight out, was about purification. What is Yeshua's sacrifice on the cross? It's to purify us from sin. It's to give us a right standing with God that we lost when our father Adam sinned and fell. There's some that says this was a an atonement for the sin of the golden calf. That this was an atonement for that sin that they have committed. So we see the similarities here. But what could this be telling us, uh, this purification? What are we purifying? The, the obvious is blood. We're purifying up the blood. This blood had to be sprinkled, which purified all of Israel. Yeshua's blood was poured out on the mercy seat once and for all after he had descended into hell, led captivity captive, and made a show of them openly. Then he ascended into heaven and poured out his blood on the mercy seat mm -hmm. once and for all. Uh, once in, you know, and all atonement. This would only last, I believe, a year. So the red heifer, the sacrifice of the red heifer, a purification of blood. So right away, I would say, have a little water, please. Oh, yeah. Right away, I would say <laughs> any diseases that involves the blood, sickle cell, any, you know, the purification of the blood. Remember, the blood travels throughout the whole body into every organ, into every tissue of the body. So if the blood is pure, the body is pure. Just as Yeshua's blood purified all of us once and for all, this sacrifice purifies the blood, 
but only on a temporary basis. So if you have any blood disorders, I don't know if this would mean, you know, the woman who had the issue of blood, who touched the hem of Yeshua's garment, uh, hemorrhaging, any type of hemorrhaging or anything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, maybe even autoimmune disease. Remember the last uh, couple of parashals and Torah portions, you know, we dealt with autoimmune uh, diseases. So, and even cancer, because cancer spreads throughout the blood. What you would say, life is in the blood. Glad you mentioned that. I almost forgot. Yeah. The life of the beast is in the blood. I would say also, this refers to the brick Hadashah practice or the New Testament practice of taking communion. Absolutely. Brother Perry, Perry Stone said, you know, he calls it the meal that heals. Amen. And Amen. I was, you know, I thought about, well, maybe I should show the people how to take communion okay. or at least show them how we take communion here in the temple. And I said, decided what I would do probably tomorrow or the next or either the next day, either tomorrow or the day after, Wednesday or Thursday, I'll make a special uh, teaching where I show you how to, t to take communion. Amen. We had the blessing of the communion table on our website so people help it, people to take communion at home. Okay. The prayer, you know, the prayer, what is that on the website? The Holy Communion Prayer that you said. You say, got the prayer? The okay. The but I, I, I'm going to demonstrate it. I'm going okay. to show them. Then they can follow up with that as, as a reference. Okay? Yeah. And I say, you know, it would be a good idea to do that. And yeah. Holy Communion takes care of everything. Yeah. Everything. I mean, but right. Thank you. when we see this, okay, okay, the, the red heifer, you know, that's corresponding to the blood. Okay, without blemish or spot or wrinkle or defect, every sacrifice had to be had to meet that criteria. But what is different here at the very end of verse 2? No yoke could have ever come upon this red heifer. It could never have been used to plow the field, pull a wagon, anything like that. Mm -hmm. What did Yeshua say? Take upon you my yoke because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Many connections there. But what does it mean here? Well, the Holy Spirit told me kind of answered the question this way. If you've ever had a dog, maybe it was a stray that wandered into your yard one day, and you said, I want to keep this dog. I like him. He likes me. I want to keep this dog. What's the first thing that most people do when they get, a, you know, find a dog like that? What's the first thing that they do? Can you test him out? Huh? To test him out? Like... No, you know, when, when you get a, a dog, say it's a stray. Oh. You know, it's all. It's not a little puppy. It's a full-grown dog. We're close to it. Take him to the vet for the, for the shots. That is one thing, you know. <laughs> let's think how we go. What's another? Okay, family feud. Um, get him washed. <laughs> get him washed. Ding. Okay. What else? Really, even before that. Feed him. Ding. Okay. I don't know. But it's a, 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 you give up? No. Okay. What's another? Okay, the first thing you do when you find a stray dog that you want to take home. That's the question, right? He, well, you want to take him home or he, he wandered into your home. He wandered into your backyard or your, your front yard. And you got to chain him up. Huh? You got to chain him up. Okay, you almost got it. You're going to put him on a rope, a leash. A leash. Okay, the leash. 
that's really that's the number one answer. Ding 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 ding. Dun 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 dun. Okay. That's the smartest answer. I don't know the number one. You go. You go get him a collar. Yeah, get him a collar. Go get him a collar, and you know you're gonna get a leash. Yeah. Okay. And maybe you chain him up because you say, well, he's wandered off before. I want to keep him. I don't want him to wander off again. Mm -hmm. And what's that dog's reaction? If that's the first time he's ever had a collar on him. He's going to hate it. He's going to try to take it off and get it off of him. He's going to go berserk. Reserves. Resist. Yeah. Most of them go berserk. Yeah. And they resist. And they, uh, some of them, oh, they almost, they almost hurt themselves. You're trying to get out of it. Trying to, trying to get that collar. Yeah. And if you got him on the leash, no, 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 no. This, what would you call what that dog is going through? Bondage. <laughs> you know, like, it's a he's form, not of, free. form of bondage. He's not free anymore. He's, he's not, not free wild. anymore. He's not free to be So wild. what would you call that? Restriction. What's another what's another name? Restriction. Ownership. Um, bondage. Control. control. What I, do you mean? Holy Spirit told me control. trauma. Oh, trauma. Okay. The dog has now been traumatized. Yeah, maybe. You've traumatized him by putting on a collar. Yeah. You just caused him all kind of trauma that he's going to have to get over. If you get a wild horse mm -hmm. Same. and you yeah. want to ride that horse, you want to keep that horse in your barn or stable or your ranch or what have you so that you can ride him, what happens the minute you uh, put a saddle on him? Buck and kick and try buck and to, kick. May even try to kill you. I don't you know, know. <laughs> he tries. To, he's bigger than a dog. Yep. Okay. He can do some serious damage if you're not careful. Do some serious damage. What did you do to the horse? You traumatized him. Okay. You put that saddle on him, and he's gonna buck and kick against that saddle. Yes. You haven't even tried to ride him yet. Right. And you know when he, when you try to ride him, he really. He puts everything he's got into it, okay? Yeah. Until he wears himself out and just begins to walk yeah. with you on his back. Trauma. So the Lord says, bring me a red heifer that has not experienced any trauma. Because what, 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 what's a result of trauma? in most cases. What is the result of trauma? Cancer or just sickness and disease? Some type of sickness or disease or yeah. It could be a you know, stress, things. yeah. But basically a more basic word before the cancer comes is what? Stress? Before <laughs> you know, yes, stress stress brings about sickness and disease. But what else? Before the stress emotional problems. That very good, <laughs> <clears throat> very good. But what? What is emotional stress? Distress. Um, sin. Oh, sin. Well, that's just that's not just emotional, you know. Okay, this may not just be emotional, but it's sin. Yeah. Trauma is immediately followed by sin. Nothing else. Sin. Whenever you introduce trauma to an individual, if that person is not highly skilled okay, you're talking in about the that. word of God. Reaction. You're talking about the reaction to an emotional it's sin. sinful. It's going to be sin. Right. We, when we don't even know anybody, we're, 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 a sin, we're born in a sinful nature. We're in the womb as our sinful nature. As soon as we're conceived, we're entering into a sinful nature. Um, and what happens because what, of all the blood of the trauma from what, the what, what happens generation. when the baby is born? That's trauma too. They call it, that's trauma. In a way. They have, you know, what there are people. scream and cry when they're first birthed out of the womb. Yeah. There are people, you know, the baby doesn't cry in the womb. Right. It's only when you take and him out of the like, womb. like, what the heck is going on here? You know, it's only when you bring him. Put it, me back in. Put me back in. <laughs> put, me back, put me back. Put me back. Until you get your mama's depressed and then you know, There just, are people who do birth trauma. You know, try to heal people of birth trauma. They got 
they give them a pillow, tell them to curl up in a ball and, and try to get in touch with that trauma from birth. And, and you know, and you got people, you know, grown people, 40 years old, you know, trying to heal them from the trauma of birth. Are you making fun of that method? Yes, I, I, can, I, I, think I, I think I am, but some people say it's very cathodic and it works. Yeah, so, I don't know how, because yeah. we have not been able to label what kind of trauma they're talking about. Trauma mm -hmm. of what? Of um, independence. Just birth. Yeah. Okay. So, go. God says, bring me a, a red heifer without blemish that has had no yoke put on them. Mm -hmm. No trauma. No, really, no sin is what it's implying. No sin. No emotional distress. So in my opinion, very simply, this is a scripture that is meant to purify you, purify your blood okay. of all trauma. Amen. Of all trauma, thereby purifying you of sin. That is what the first two verses of this Torah portion is about. That's what it's trying to heal. Now, to further back that up, when we look at the theme of the previous Torah portion, what happened? In last week's Torah portion okay. called Korak. Complained and rebelled okay. against Moses yeah. and Aaron. And a plague, they caused a oh, plague, plague to come upon them. Okay. And people were dropping like flies. And Aaron had to run into the tent of meeting, take coal off the fire, put it in his censer, take some incense, and run out. Mm -hmm. And he stood between the living and the dead, and the angel of death mm -hmm. could not mm -hmm. pass through mm -hmm. the midst of the smoke of the incense. Mm -hmm. So that's what they had just gone through. Okay. What would you call that? See, we don't think about this a Bible a lot of times in human terms. Mm -mm. What would you call that? And, uh, there's so many things they could call it. A traumatizing that. event. Okay. Yes, it was all of it. Yeah. What would happen to you if you saw your friends and neighbors swallowed up before your very eyes into the earth? Mm. Yeah, you'd be messed up, boy. You, you'd be, oh, my, whoa. You'd be messed up. Yeah. You would be messed up. You're talking about, uh, you These know. These are the best men of the, each tribe. Huh? Korak brought yeah. the best as the, the leaders. I, I won't say the best, but he brought representatives the, of each tribe. They were selected as because they were the best. Yeah, they, represent, they were a representation of Israel. Right. You know, therefore they were a representation of the body. Yeah. Therefore, is, this is also a representation, anthropomorphically, is a reputation of the body. Representation. And now the body has to be purified and cleansed of trauma and of sin. Very good. Wow. Yeah. So this is a scripture that purifies the blood of trauma and sin. So it is mainly talking about emotional. Now, we know that emotional sin will lead to a physical ailment. So this scripture covers a lot of healing in general because it goes down to the root, to the emotions where sickness and disease begins. So it's talking about cleansing and purifying the auras because you perceive through your auras and your eyes. Remember, it's, it's purifying the blood. The red heifer signifies the blood. Yeah. 
Blood is liver. Blood is eyes. They needed to be purified for what they had, the horror of what they had just witnessed. Yes. Korak and his followers, the earth opening up and, and just swallowing them up. Just like you open your mouth to put a piece of food in. That's what the earth did to Korak and his followers. Now, if that wasn't enough, then they see a plague hit the camp and people dropping left and right. Aaron, Aaron had to move. He had to, he couldn't say, well, you know, let me do this and let me do that. He had to run into the tent of meeting. And I mean, it was urgency. He had to do it quick. 911. 911. All the way. First responder. Yeah. For Aaron was the first responder. Right. So Aaron needed to be purified also. And when we read the verses following verses 1 and 2, it talks about the priests being purified. Hmm. So Aaron was a, you know, and, and his sons and the Levites, you know, they needed to be purified. Yeah. It talked about purifying them first. The first responders. Okay. You know, they had to get out of PTSD. Yeah. Then the P, you know, so that they can get the people out of PTSD. So this is a scripture for purifying for dealing with PTSD. This is a scripture for first responders, getting their hearts and minds straight. Amen. So not only is it a scripture for PTSD and purifying the blood, it's also a scripture that heals not only the blood, but the bloodline. Because we know now through epigenetics that trauma attaches to your DNA. And you can pass whatever you've gone through of a horrific nature, especially if it was a mass event. You know, everybody in the nation saw this. All of Israel saw this. So this was a mass event. And when you have that much trauma at that, you know, all at one time like that, it can be passed down genetically. Yeah. So not only to purify themselves, but their bloodline, their children's 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 children. So that any nothing epigenetically can attach to be passed down. Yeah. I want to say gracias to a brother Julio de Sid. His comment is very loving. He says from the West, beautiful family, shalom, 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 beautiful family. Thank you. The beautiful world pose. Thank you, brother. Thank you. So this is a scripture that you should meditate on to remove trauma from your life. Whenever maybe you're feeling too stressed out or you've had some trauma that has hit you and your family, this is the scripture that you should meditate on, that you should scan in Hebrew, say in Hebrew, if you know how to pronounce it. The link is shared. They can see it in Hebrew if they want to right now. Okay. This is the scripture for that. Right. To remove all trauma, all the seeds of PTSD. This is it. This is the scripture that keep you from losing your mind. Now, I'm going to kind of prove that to you. You know, we're kind of talking more about emotions. We're talking about the internal organs but we're going to the root, to the 
negative trauma that affects the internal organs over time. Okay. I want to read something to you out of the Kabbalistic Bible. And I just read this moments before I came on the air. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wasn't going to rest it. Well, let me take a minute and read this, okay? And it says, the red heifer has the power to nullify and neutralize the effects of the sin of worshiping the golden calf, which was the introduction of death. The rabbis believe that if the Israelites had not committed the sin of worshiping the golden calf, that that would elim have eliminated death from the world, just like it was not in the world during the time of Adam. But when they worshiped the golden calf, that sin took on the stronghold of death. Mm -hmm. So, you know, did you catch that? The red heifer has the power to nullify and neutralize the effects of the sin of worshiping the golden calf, which was the introduction of death. Today, we still worship golden calves in the form of our addictions and desires mm -hmm. that remove us from the light. That's right. By connecting to this section, what have I been telling you to do past 39 weeks? Connect with the first verse or the first two verses by meditating on the characters. You don't have to know Hebrew, but you do have to meditate on the Hebrew characters. Right. And if you can pronounce them even better, if you know the meaning of the words, whoa, explosive. Very good. But all you have to do, though, to receive the healing is simply scan from right to left, because you read Hebrew from right to left, those Hebrew words and characters. Okay? By connecting this section, by connecting to this section, we are not just reading about something that happened many years ago. We are being given the power to remove death in every form from our lives. Purification. This is all about purification. Whether physical death, emotional death in our relationships, or psychological death in the form of inner conflict and emotional pain. And replacing it with the life force of the Creator. One more time, one, one more time mm -hmm. on that. By connecting to this section, we are not just reading about something that happened many years ago. We are being given the power. We're being given the power to remove death in every form from our lives. Whether physical death, emotional death, in our relationships, or psych psychological death, in the form of inner conflict and emotional pain and replacing it with the life force okay. of the creator we're given the power through the hebrew characters to eliminate to purify amen now isn't that what yeshua does is isn't that what he did once and for all so by taking communion, we eliminate death. Mm -hmm. When we take communion on a regular basis, Brother Perry Stones in the middle of the hills says that he advises people to take communion if they're sick two to three times a day, mm -hmm. representing the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Okay, yeah. And then you can even throw in the afternoon sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, I don't want to just run through it. You know, I want to show you and explain to you in detail why I take communion the way that I do. You know, I, I had a classmate 
in seminary, he would just drop by the house and say, Vince, I want to, I want to take communion with you. I said, oh, you want to take communion? He said, I want you to perform communion. Is that Joseph? Yeah. Yeah, Brother Joseph. He want, it was the way that I, <clears throat> the way that I do communion, that's what he wanted. No one taught me how to do it that way but the Holy Spirit. Amen. And if he was troubled, he want, he would just, just drop by, be a knock at the door. Hey, man, come on in. What's up? And he wanted to take communion. So when are you going to do this? Because I know people are going to be like, when? Because they go, what, what's a good time? What's now? a good time to do it tomorrow? I want to do it now, but... <laughs> I want to take my time with you. I, I know what you mean. You didn't want to rush it through. I understand, but yeah. people are going to be like... What's a good time for us to do it tomorrow? Think do we tomorrow. want to do it first thing, or do we want to do it at noon tomorrow? We want to do it first thing in the morning. You want to do it first thing in the morning? Get it out of the way, then we can it's a good carry on our work day. Blessed, so, fully blessed. So what time? Mm -hmm. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock? Uh, 9 is okay. 9, 9 o'clock? Yeah. Okay. All right, now when I get you out of bed, I don't want to hear no complaints. <laughs> Okay, 9 o'clock tomorrow. I'm going to show you how to take communion. And he would also want me to blow the shofar on him. Yes. He wanted to take communion, and he wanted me to blow the shofar over him. Okay. There, there's a, there is a connection. And when I show you this tomorrow, you'll see it. Amen. Glory to God. All right. And um, so that's what we're doing when we take communion. That's what you're doing when you meditate on this verse in Hebrew, very, very powerful. You know, to give you an idea, yesterday, Sister Leslie and I, you know, Sister Leslie was driving. We drove, you know, around 300 miles uh, to get to a property uh, that I was appraising. Mm -hmm. And our truck doesn't have any air conditioning. And it was 100 degrees yesterday, so it's like six hours round trip. So we're sitting in a 100 degree or over 100 degree truck for six hours out of the day yesterday, at least, you know, close to three hours each stretch there and back. And I felt fine. I, I had two bottles of Gatorade. I, <laughs> I downed two bottles of Gatorade. I had but it was weird, some some water. It said 100. It said I 100. had some tea. It's weird. Didn't feel and it. I felt fine. Yeah, I really did not feel the heat. I, I felt a cool breeze, but it still said 100 degrees. Yeah, because we had the windows down, of course. Yeah, but still it should have been hot. Yeah, it was hot still hot. in the heat. In mile high. No, we were out in the plains. We were in the eastern plains, so we weren't at the elevation of Denver. No, I know that, but what was the elevation? Pretty high still. I don't know. I don't know what the, what's it's the elevation of Eads, Colorado. <laughs> but the humidity was something like 8%, which is like. It was rough. I we didn't know. never remember. You know, I, I grew up in Detroit, Chicago. We have 80, 90% immunity. I mean, humidity. Then we lived in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. 4, they have 120%. 4,200 feet. For, so it's still pretty high. Mm -hmm. 4,000 feet just not a mile high. Right. But, um, and I got home and I kind of felt, felt drained, you know, and I, I sat down in the easy chair, still feeling a bit drained. And all of a sudden, I had an intense pain in my stomach. Like I used to get when I was a little kid and you eat too much candy, yeah. you get a stomach ache. And so I hopped up, I said, oh boy, uh-oh, what did I eat? I better get into the bathroom and cop a seat for a while. And before I could get into the bathroom, I got so dizzy and lightheaded. By the time I got to the bathroom, and I, it felt like I was going like that. I thought I was going down. I grabbed the towel rack, pulled myself and spun around and when I pulled and spun around and yep. sat down on that toilet before I could, you know, before I fell down. And I started to feel okay. Sat there a while and I said, gee, I, I do have to get up. And I, you know, I was a little nervous about it because I wondered if, if that dizziness was going to return, if mm -hmm. I was going to pass out. Well, I didn't. 
And I made it back to my, my easy chair. And I just felt, yeah, what? Well. And I guess, I guess it was the Holy Spirit. Because I've never had that happen before. Yeah. And I caught Leslie had gone to the grocery store to get something for dinner, you know. And I called up. I said, you need to get back here quick. I, I, I just almost passed out. I don't know why, but I almost passed out. And I said, when you get here, I want you to take my blood pressure. I've got my own blood pressure cut. Now, and I said, my blood pressure is too low. I know it. Yeah. I've never in my life ever had low blood pressure. Never. Not once. I don't know what it feels like. I, at least then I didn't until yesterday. I don't know what the symptoms of low blood pressure are. I've never had it happen to me. Knew absolutely nothing about it. But the Holy Spirit told me, your blood pressure is too low. I knew it in an instant. Like I knew my name. In an instant. You know, I didn't go to doctors.com and type in my symptoms or anything. I just knew. Yeah. And Sister Leslie got in and put the blood pressure cup on my arm and took my blood pressure. It was 80 over 55. Now, 120 over 80 is normal. And, you know, on mm -hmm. all parameters, I'm way too low. She first did it on the left, then she did it on the right, got the same reading. I said, call the doctor, should I go into the emergency room? You know, what's the dangers of having low blood pressure? I mean, you know, what am I in risk of right here? And so I called the doctor and it got on my nerves, you know. Uh, I said, is my blood pressure, if I took it, is it too low? Should I go into the emergency room? Or if I just sit here and relax, I'll be fine. I don't know, sir, I'm not a nurse. <laughs> and I'm like, what good is you answering the phone then? In the case of where it said, I can pay your provider. I said, okay, yeah, pay you, pay you. I hung up the phone and I said, call 911. Let me ask the dispatcher there. Got the same story. When is your name? What's the number you're calling from? All right. What's your address? How old are you? What's your date of birth? <laughs> What's your name and you're like. <laughs> you know, and I'm like. Here they go over the question. Folks, y'all are wasting my time. Here we go. <laughs> you know? And finally said, he said, I'm not a nurse. He said, the paramedics will make that determination. Do you want them to come or not? And I said, yeah, let them come. Let them come. And they came, you know, they sent about seven people. And I don't know about elsewhere, but the paramedics here, like, look like they just got I out know. the gym, they, you know. Yeah. You know. So they came, about seven of them. <laughs> I said, do you boys know you're sure? <laughs> A.K.A. Jesus? A couple of them said, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Some of them didn't want to answer. But you yeah. know, <laughs> the others, about two of them said, yeah. Uh, and one of them said, are you asking me? I said, yeah, I'm asking. Then they started with their questions, so I couldn't, yeah. you know, get into it anymore with them, you know. And they took my blood pressure and came up with the same thing. And they said, um, I guess Leslie had told them I was a minister minister and they said, uh, Reverend, we want to, uh, some, some of them called me Reverend, some of them called me uh, Mr. Vince or whatever, said, we want to take you to the, we want to transport you, we want to take you to the emergency room, you know, I don't know why, you know, he's, uh, the lead guy was saying, I don't know why your blood pressure is so low, but, uh, and that day yesterday, somebody had died, mm -hmm. a bike rider on a bike trail who didn't drink enough water and died on the bike trail. Right. They say for a half hour bike ride, it was so hot that you needed to drink. If you're gonna ride a bike like that and be that strenuous, you should consume uh, two gallons or two and a half gallons of water. Up here, of course, in Denver. Up right. here in Denver with the altitude the and everything. really high. Even though we don't have uh, humidity like um, a lot of us are used to. I'll say, wow. So he said, yeah, I, I want to take you in. You know, I think you got an electrolyte imbalance. I think you got the high, and they asked me what I had been doing all day. I told them I was riding in the truck. I said, I, but I, I stayed really hydrated. You know, I, I drank my two bottles of Gatorade <laughs> and a half a bottle of water, and I had some iced tea. You know, I, I was really hydrated. You know, I didn't, 
you know, and I wasn't sweating profusely. And then my best friend told me, said, when the, when you got low humidity, like eight, you know, or <laughs> almost low. zero, you can be sweating and losing moisture without seeing sweat dripping off you. knowing it, yeah. I don't know if he's right, but that's what he told me. I said, oh, okay. So they um, got me into the vehicle and immediately put an IV in. And my blood pressure shot up, went up to from that 50 over 80 to 101 over 70 or something like that. So it helped, you know, mm -hmm. replenishing my, my fluids like that. And... I maybe talk about this tomorrow, get a little more time or whatever. We're in the process of purchasing the healing retreat right now. And all day, you know, for days, for weeks, I've just been meditating and seeing the retreat and seeing us minister in the retreat and people getting healed. And when Leslie told me what my blood pressure was. My my finance person from the mortgage company called and said, Vince, I got you approved. You're approved to buy the retreat. I'm you know putting together the, the pre-approval letters. You can have your realtor make the offer. But even before my mortgage broker called, when Leslie told me, as soon as she told me that what my blood pressure was, I kind of giggled and laughed. I said, ah, <laughs> uh-uh. I knew immediately it was an attack from the enemy. The enemy was trying to get me to say, oh, Lord, well, why now? What's this? What's this going? Yeah, I've been serving you. I've been doing this. I've been good, I've been righteous, I yeah, haven't done this, character. I haven't that's done that, right. and now you're letting my blood pressure drop, and you're letting the enemy kill me, and you know, take me to a sick bed, bed of affliction, and all this stuff, <laughs> but instead I, I just, let's see, talk, I said, <laughs> I'm going to get the loan, I, I, so I didn't say it, she didn't hear me, but I said to myself, I'm going to get the loan, I'm close, yeah, I heard. you heard me yeah, say yeah, it? yeah, I knew, okay, I said, I'm going to get the loan. I'm, cl I'm close. It, it's about to happen. Yeah. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. Most of us would have let that trauma make us speak something out of our mouth contrary to, to what, what God is speaking. Saying. Absolutely. See, the enemy hears the decrees of God before we do. Mm. And he says, and then he sends his demons to us. Hey, 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 God's getting ready to bless them. See if we can mess it up. Right. See if we can get, you know, go down and hit him with something and, you know, see if we can mess it up. Because mm. then we'll start, because we'll start thinking, I should be protected. I should be covered. You know, I'm under the blood. He shouldn't be able to come down here and mess with me like this. But it's only in our mind. Mm -hmm. The trauma. Mm -hmm. The trauma isn't, re isn't real. In Kabbalah, they said, what you see feel, taste, and touch is the 99%. No, is the 1%. Which you can't see, feel, touch, or hear is the one is the 99%. Let me get that right. That's right, right that's right. Which you can't hear or see is the 99%. That's what's really real. All this, you know, That's the one percent, but we act like the one percent is the ninety-nine. Is the ninety-nine? Yeah, because we don't see. see. But I knew better. I knew better. I just laughed. Oh boy, we about to get paid. Yes, Amen. Amen. You know, Amen. I'm sitting there. We about to get paid. <laughs> more money, more money, more money. <laughs> and then he he still tried to mess with us. Because when they put me in the truck and took me out, Leslie was going to follow in, in the truck. And she calls me at the hospital. Or I called her and I said, where you at? What? He said, you won't believe this. I said, what? 
She said, I tried to pull out of the driveway and the truck died. Yep. Just wouldn't let me I go. laughed again. I said, <laughs> I said, it'll start tomorrow. Don't worry. Yeah. You know, don't even worry about it. You know, because what did the enemy just say? Yeah. Oh, God. You can't, because when you're buying property, you can't go out and apply for any other credit. You know, you leave everything alone because it just complicates everything. That's if your credit score is, you know, like really. Well, I don't care what credit score you have. If you're like 800. It doesn't matter. I have, I have put together <laughs> groups of people buying property, and somebody in the partnership will decide they want a fur coat. I've had a deal for like seven to ten houses go down the tubes because this woman in Detroit, when I was doing real estate in Detroit, saw a, a, a sale mm -hmm. for fur coats. Messed up the whole deal. Wow. Really? Yeah. Don't matter. You know, it complicates things. Okay. It may still go through, but they, they want to look at this. Mm -hmm. Now they got to redo their numbers. You, you're getting uh, a, a $10,000 fur coat. They got to readjust all the numbers. What's that payment going to look like? How long? How much? All of that. How does that figure into this? Mm -hmm. And they tell you, if we get ready, if you're getting ready to buy a house, you do not go and try to buy a new car while you're trying to buy a new house. You wait till you close. Then you can go buy your car. Okie dokie. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we've had some credit card offers. They said, ooh, Leslie said, look, ooh, look at this limit that they're giving you. I think you should do that when I said, no, 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 no. Let's wait, you know, let's chill. Okay. And we did. And here we are. We've been approved. We got the financing in place. But that trauma of what happened to you, you know, the devil, you know what the devil was saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that he thinks he's got me on the ropes with low blood pressure, almost passing out. I ain't never passed out in my life. Almost passing out. Now, Leslie says, oh, the car just died. What was the, what, what was the devil saying? More money, more money, more, more money. Because you, you got to get a new car now. Mm -hmm. Or the bill going to be so big. And what did it take? How many thousands of dollars do you need for earnest money? For closing costs? For this? You're going to move the ministry from uh, Aurora, Colorado, all the way down to the Gainesville, Florida area? How much is that going to cost? And now you need a new truck. Or you got some big repairs. You're supposed to leave this money in the bank so that they can see it, so that you have proof of this income and that income. So the devil was going, hey, more money, more money, more money. But you know what God in a, sometimes God and the holy angels will agree with the devil every now and then. You know what God and the holy angels were saying? More money, more money, more money, more money. You know? He was saying the same thing. Yeah, more money. More, take it to him. Take, take it to him. Get more money, more money, more money, more money, more money. Funny. You know, but the devil was, he was saying the same thing God was saying, mm -hmm. but he was putting his spin on it. Right. But I didn't let that trauma there you go. take hold. Amen. The doctor came in. He said, oh, you dehydrated. You had a cramp. And that's connected to your vagus nerve, runs runs down the side of your neck. I know this from Oriental Medicine. Down here, you had that cramp because you were dehydrated. Mm -hmm. And it constricted or caused a, a response in the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve controls your blood pressure. You, went, you stood up and boom. They call it, what, what is it called again? Vaso? Vasovagal, vasovagal syncope. Okay. Can I say it again? <laughs> vasovagal syncope. And you don't need no medication for it. You just need to hydrate and chill. Okay. And they put that IV in me, kept that IV in. 
uh, put this uh, monitor my blood pressure for like three hours to see. Kept asking me a hundred times, you feel okay? You dizzy? Got any pain anywhere? Just kept asking me that over and over again for like three or four hours. Then they, you know, let me go put all kind of plugs and stickers on me, monitoring, you know, doing an EKG. I had, I went to sleep with stickers. I thought I had got them all <laughs> off me when I came EKG home. Stickers. And I went like that in my sleeping suit. There's oh, another, there's another one. Oh, there, oh there, there's his brother. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I, I missed the two up top and the two down on my, I didn't even know that they had, you know, it went all up in my legs and put that down there and everything. I you know, had them all on me, monitoring me and everything. But I didn't let that trauma get to me. And I hadn't even read the Torah portion yet about trauma. Mm. But I didn't let it take hold. Yeah. And, you know, I knew... When Leslie told me what my blood pressure was, I knew I had won. That's right. Brother Chuck Pierce told a story years ago. He and his wife, I think, probably had been married 15, 20 years, but at any rate, however long it was, they were having a problem conceiving. They had been trying and trying to conceive a child, and it just looked like it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. In Texas, and he's the head of Glory of Zion International down in Denton, praying. Apostle Pierce had been praying. And said one night he woke up and it was a demon standing in here. And the demon said, snarling and growling at him. I'm going to kill your children. I'm here to kill your children. Yeah. Apostle Pierce's first action was, Hallelujah! Glory to God. People think you're crazy, but we okay, know. because he didn't even have any children. In order for the demon to kill it, to kill his children, he God had to first give him some. You know, he was just trying to see if he could get. Apostle Pierce to agree with the devil mm. that he wasn't going to have any kids. The devil was going to kill him. The devil was going to stop it. But he knew that, hey, first thing, you know, you know, before you can kill it, I got to get it. Right. And he knew that the Lord was getting blessing with children. And That's I think right. in a few weeks or a month, he learned that his wife was pregnant with their first child. Now I think they have two or three now. And none of them, you know, the devil hasn't been able to put his hand on any of them. Okay? So, from that testimony that I heard maybe 15 years ago, I don't know how many years ago, I heard him give that testimony. I knew mm -hmm. that I had won. I knew this was just the enemy. This was a attack of the enemy and I got my team together I got my mortgage broker and my realtor all on the same page today and they are placing the offer on the healing retreat down in Florida mm -hmm. we're knowing a, a day or two um, wherever the offer was accepted rejected or count, but it doesn't matter right. what the reply on the offer is. We're going to Florida and we're going to purchase a, a retreat very soon. Mm -hmm. My financing is already in place. That's like I got cash money in hand. I'm already approved. I just got to find if this guy says no, that ain't the only house. Mm -hmm. Oh, hmm. it's going to have land because yeah. it's going to be a healing retreat center. This one that we have an offer on has seven acres, and we're going to build that out. 
you know, have various facilities to do ministry, you know, for the saints, maybe, maybe even some, you know, living quarters so people can stay with us over time. Even we will, uh, depends on what the zoning says, or even we will expand the existing home to accommodate, you know, uh, five to 10 more people, but uh, maybe five more bedrooms and two or three more bathrooms so people can come and stay with us and we can minister to them. You know, people who are fighting and battling cancer mm -hmm. and other uh, potentially fatal and chronic diseases. And, you know, and we will be full-time in the ministry. We'll need your support. I'll, I'll give you the details over the next few days. Uh, let you know what happens. If they accept the offer, you know, we'll, we'll break in on social media, just like this is a news, Channel 7 News special report. This just in. Breaking news, SIM Temple and Energy Center mm -hmm. has just been awarded, you know, seven, ten acres of land and so many thousand, you know, three, four thousand square feet facility, you know, that's going to be u utilized for the healing ministry. Partly because I didn't let that trauma take hold. I refuse to say anything that God's not saying. Amen. I'm going to win either way. You know, this is either the house that God wants to, and the land that God wants us to have and nobody can do anything about it. Or he was just pointing me in that general area and saying, look here, okay, keep going. There's, I got another one for, and I, I got something better or whatever. That's how God does. That's how he's done us. He opens the doors that he wants us to step through and he closes all the others around it so that we don't get distracted. So we've learned to let him do his thing and not to worry and not to get upset. You know, today, um, a realtor said, hey, I need that, that pre-qualification letter from the mortgage company so that I can put the offer in. Because all of a sudden, the property's been on the market for about a year. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they say they got another interested buyer. I said, mm -hmm. I ain't that something. Right. Property just been sitting there for about a year. And now they got two people want to look at the same property at the same time. That ain't nothing but the devil trying to get me to say, oh, they may get it instead of me. I doubt it. And, it, and even if you do, hey, cool. God got something better. God got something better. God got God something better. better. Yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get it, God. Watch him go. You know? So, and my, you know, I got peep, spirit filled people on my team helping me put this deal together from financing to negotiating uh, with the owner. And my mortgage broker said, Vince, because I, I, I said, hey, I need that, that letter uh, ASAP right now so we can put in the offer. And she said, Vince, I've learned that with God, I don't rush. That's right. I just walk in the anointing. There you go. Keep the blessing. I said, okay, thing. I got you. Okay, whatever. Well, can you give me that letter? She said, I already sent you the letter. We already have it. Mm -hmm. But she just reminded me, don't get in a rush. Don't get in a rush. And we've noticed something with the legal description that we don't like and that we want to get clarified, you know, before we go forward anyway. So just some things to get straightened out, get mm -hmm. untangled here. But we're going. We got the money. The Lord's telling us to go. We just don't know which particular piece of land we're going to get. You know, some of them have two acres, some have five, some have 20 something. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I just have to see which one does God want, want us to, to get. We're going to get one of them. All we need is one. Right. You know, there's one down there with our name on it. Okay? We'll know in a few days. We'll know in a few days. Okay. okay. So join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. 
mountaintop. And I'm going to show you how to take communion. Amen. How to bring into fruition what today's Torah portion is talking about. Okay? Okay. Shabbat Shalom. May the blessings of our risen Savior, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, be upon you. And this from the prophet. More money, more <laughs> money, more money, more money. For the kingdom. Amen. Keep it great. Right? All right. Amen. How long was that?